G'day team and welcome back to the channel. My name's Tony and this is the Mighty Overlander. And this episode I think is gonna be one of the more popular ones that I do this year and it's only the start of the year. So I'm really looking forward to this one actually. What I'm gonna be doing today is a full walk around of the Mighty Overlander from front to back, top to bottom, inside and out. We're gonna cover absolutely everything. Now the reason why I think that this is gonna be one of the more popular episodes that I've done or will do is because of the amount of questions that I get about various aspects of the vehicle, from the awning to the roof rack system to the tires, tire sizes, which is always a big one. So I'm gonna cover absolutely everything today. I'm gonna to go through why I've chosen what I've, what I've actually put onto the vehicle, um, if there was any other options available at the time, and also other options that I might choose to go for in the future and some pros and cons of those pieces of kit that I've actually got on the vehicle. So look, strap myself in guys, go get yourself a nice cold one. I'll do all the hard work and join me on a full walk around of the Mighty Overlander. Let's go. All right, team, so in good walk around fashion, let's start at the front end and talk about the bar work up the front and what I've got hanging off that. And then we're gonna walk through to the back, up the top, have a look at the roof, and then we'll jump on the inside. Now, keeping in mind, I was the second or third person in West Australia to pick up the JB74 when it came out back in 2019. So at the time, there were certain limitations to the aftermarket products that were available. Now the aftermarket parts market is absolutely gangbusters and there's a million different things that you can get, especially out of Japan and South Africa and even here in Australia. So there's absolutely huge amounts of options now compared to what um, I had when I first put the car together. That being said though, um, there are a few options here that whilst they were the only option at the time, I still think I would every day of the week pick those as well. Anyway, let's start. So the bar work at the front. Well, with the bar work, I've gone with the ARB front bar. And at the time it was between this and I believe the AFN bar, which I didn't really uh, like all that much. Now, when it comes down to bull bars and your personal preference for bull bars, um, there's gonna be a few things that you're gonna have to take into account. First things like obviously the cost, the weight, um, a full loop bar, like with the full protection or just a, essentially a, a steel bumper. Now I've gone with a full loop ARB bar and the main reason was one, yes, it was one of the only ones available at the time but the protection that this offers the front of the vehicle is really good like it's outstanding now I'm not talking about protection in regards to things like vehicle accidents because that's not what a bull bar is for a bull bar is for exactly what it sounds like animal strikes bulls right now here in Australia we call them rhubars because you know that's more likely what we're going to come into contact with um, the main reason that you want one of these is to limit the amount of damage from your standard kind of four wheel driving mishaps that happen out in the bush. And I'm talking about things like scrubbing in front of, you know, small trees and things like that, um, small animal strikes. I mean, look, if you hit a big red roo, that's still gonna be a problem for you. And the chances are it's gonna hop right over this and then straight to your, to your windscreen. So, uh, you know, that's kind of not what it's for, but it's those, those small incidents where you can do um, a fair bit of damage to the front end if you don't have that kind of protection. And this does offer that kind of protection. But one of the other things that it does is it does offer a really solid platform for a couple of the other modifications. Now, in particular, that is for the UHF aerial system that I've got here, my spotlights, both the uh, ARB intensity ones that I've got up the top here, uh, down the bottom here, but also in conjunction with the ones that I've got up the top, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But also this bad boy here, the worn winch that I've got at the front here. Now, when it comes to your bull bar choice, like I said, there's gonna be a few things to take into account, but one of the main ones is weight. Now, the ARB bar is not the lightest on the market, and I will admit that. Um, it can be a little bit heavier in the front end than maybe you would like, especially once you start hanging a bit of extra fruit off of it. But uh, keep that into, in, in mind, and also keep it in mind into what kind of full driving that you're gonna be doing. If you're gonna be coming out here into the bush like I frequently do, or you do those kind of big long trips like we did going across the Gunbarrel Highway and the like, then you're gonna need full protection on the front. Um, you know, there's always gonna be instances where you're gonna come into contact with, with wildlife or with really dense scrub or something like that, where you do kind of need that extra protection. So uh, my advice in regards to this one here, go a full loop bar that's nice and solid and is also steel. 
Um, so you, you know, you've got that really good solid protection at the front. You don't have the alley stuff that's going to crumple. Um, if you're going to be coming out in the outback and doing stuff like I've been doing, if you're only doing stuff around town and you're doing the odd run down to the beach, you can get away with a, you know, if you just want the aesthetics of a, of a nice steel bar, you can get away with a loopless bar and they're perfectly fine. Um, it really kind of comes down to the kind of full driving that you're going to be doing. And that also brings me into the next part of what's up the front here, and that is the ARB Intensity Spotlights. Now, I chose these particular spotlights because I got them installed at the same time that I got the ARB bar put on. So as you can see, they match in perfectly, um, and I got it all done as a one and I believe that it kind of cost me around the three and a half thousand dollar mark um, at the time when I put it together. Um, they are brilliant, they haven't let me down once, and they certainly turn night into day. Um, you'll see with these, one will be a spotlight and the other will be a floodlight. And what I mean by that is the floodlight will basically open out like this, and you'll have a much, much uh, wider beam of light that will reach into the bush on the sides. And what's that? That's basically for spotting those, you know, the, the wildlife that are sitting on the side of the road and the side of the track and stuff like that, about to jump out and bang in the side of your car. Um, and then you've got the, the spotlight itself for throwing light down the actual track itself so you can see as far into the distance as possible. Um, like I said, in conjunction with those, I've got a couple of small LED bars on the roof that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and that's once again though, just to open up and they're more floody and they just open up the, that field of uh, light for me. Now, on my normal headlights, I've put a couple of these little steel cages. Now, for the most part, they are just a kind of aesthetic kind of thing. I like the look of them. And they do offer a very small amount of protection just to the actual light um, plastic and glass at the front there as well. They were ones that I picked up off eBay or uh, AliExpress or something like that, and they're just stuck on. And now they've been actually on there for over a year and they've worked perfectly so there's no issues there um, and they they look fine um, and they're an easy install so yeah I recommend you know anyone that wants to do those kind of like little fun um, installs and mods and accessories and stuff like that do it you know um, it makes the car yours and it certainly improves uh, the feeling that you get of customizing it and it really being your car as well all right, so moving down, we're going to have a look now at the worn winch. Okay, so the worn winch. Now, um, full disclosure, um, and I'll be doing this throughout the video, guys. Um, I didn't pay for this one. This one was uh, gifted by Warn, so thank you very much to Warn. And when it came down to the choice of winch, um, I had two schools of thought. Now, I was always going to go probably a Warn anyway. They are considered to be you know, the, some of the best winches in the world, if not the best winches in the world. So that was really not a hard uh, decision to make when it was offered to me. Um, the real decision was which one. Now there's two main winches that suit the Jimny um, from the worn lineup, and that's the Axion 55 Esh, which, which, is, a, which is actually a, an ATV winch, really. Um, it's a 5,500 uh, pound winch. And then the one that I've decided to go with, which is the Evo 8S, which is a um, 8,000 pound synthetic rope winch. Now, the reason why I went with the 8,000 pound opposed to the 5,500 pound, whilst the 5,500 would have more than easily been able to winch me out of, you know, 90% of situations, um, and it would have actually been about 10 kilos or so less than, or seven or eight kilos or so less than what the the Evo 8 is, um, it's an ATV winch. So you had to kind of like build a plate and modify the way that it kind of sat in there. Um, and it wasn't really fit for purpose, if you know what I mean. So instead we went with the, um, the Evo 8S and that was installed over at um, over with Phil the Mechanic and there's a full install video on the channel if you wanna have a look at that one. Now, have I used it yet? No. I have not. Um, I haven't had to yet, and I will be doing at some point this year a little recovery vi uh, video and everything like that, but for the most part, it's more of an insurance policy. When it comes down to using your winch and things like that, um, it's gonna be used in essentially two situations. You know, recovering yourself or someone else, or to move things out of the way to crack on down the track. That includes things like logs and all those kinds of things. Um, so this particular one with the synthetic rope means that you're gonna have, it's a lot safer. Um, it's a lot lighter in regards to the difference between that and a steel cable rope. Um, obviously you still need to use your weight blankets and everything, uh, but I particularly like this one because it's got a both wireless and wired 
capability for the controller. So the controller actually uh, clicks in up here, um, or I can actually do it completely wirelessly, which is super handy, um, which means I can, and also the cable is quite long. So even if the wireless batteries run out, from the safety of the inside of my vehicle, I can then sit there and control the winch with that one, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty handy kind of aspect to have with that. But also talking about recovery, let's have a look underneath at the recovery points. Okay, so with recovery points, um, it's very much recommended that you install some aftermarket properly tested and load rated recovery points to the vehicle. So there are um, like this little kind of factory towing point there and some people try and recover off that and end up bending it. So, you know, my recommendation is to grab something a little bit more like what I've got here because it certainly does give you a proper rated recovery point, um, which is much safer for all of your recoveries. Now, the ones that I've gone here are from Bay House. Now, once again, full disclosure, they sent me these ones out and there is a full install video on the channel as well. Now, with the Bay House ones, they're a Queensland brand, um, really top quality product. Um, they are a billet aluminium anodized in the red and they also come in a black and a gold, I think. Um, and they are also specifically designed for the soft shackle type uh, setups because they've got this beveled edge around here on the actual connection point and that's probably the most important part of these particular ones. Now these are specifically designed for the ARB bar um, so you know kind of keep that in mind when you are uh, choosing recovery points. There's ones from like Ironman and there's also ones from uh, a couple of the kind of knockoff joints online from like Chinese manufacturers and stuff like that. Um, I personally look I, I'd always recommend getting something Australian made in the first place that way if there's an issue then you can go back to them um, and you're covered by warranties a little bit easier. But more so, these particular ones being specifically designed for those soft shackle recoveries and a lot of recovery kits, in particular like the one that I've got from Sabre, have gone to that soft shackle type uh, recovery system, mainly because it's considerably safer. And having that beveled edge means that you're not gonna cut those particular type of soft shackles. Um, now these particular recovery points are uh, CNC'd in such a way that they match the actual structure of the front of the car. So you've got like three or four, you know, points of contact per uh, recovery point. You've got one on the, both the passenger and the driver's side. And it just means that you've got a considerably more sturdy, and these ones are rated to three ton. So, you know, which is more than t twice what the vehicle is. So, and that's each, you know, so you could probably lift this thing up a bloody tree with them. So yeah, definitely have a look at those ones. Check out that, um, that install video on those if you're interested in them. But like I said, uh, Bayhouse are a really quality, a really good quality Queensland brand here in Australia, and uh, you know they just they look the business. They look really good. They're super solid, um, and you know they just gives you the confidence when you do have to do those kind of recoveries, in particular when you're winching or you're snatching, um, that the front end of the car is not going to disappear, or you're not going to you know suddenly rocket out a, a hard shackle from your your snatch strap or something into the back windscreen of someone else's car. So yeah, no, really good quality there. Now also under here, we've also got the bash plate. Now the bash plate's from Custom Off-Road and uh, they're also a Queensland brand and an Australian brand and they did send me that one out. Um, there is a full install video on that one as well. And that one's just the one bash plate just pro to, to protect like the steering arms and stuff like that at the front. Um, if you remember young Sam who came on one of my uh, adventures a while back, um, he went out full driving with some other mates and ended up actually snapping his panard rod at the front because there was no protection on the front there. So I highly recommend that you have a look at something like the Custom Off-Road set. Um, you know, both Bay House and Custom Off-Road do really good quality bash plates at the front. Um, and the ones from Custom Off-Road are really good quality stainless steel and they'll anodize them in any color that you want or color them in any color that you want, powder coat maybe probably powder coat in any color that you want um, and also give you uh, a really good uh, deal as well as a really good uh, like support and warranty if any issues go there so once again you know support your locals guys they're they're pretty good okay so that's the majority of the front let's just uh, jump up the top here and have a look at some of these other smaller accessories that i've added okay so when it comes down to modifying your vehicle not every single thing that you do has to be some sort of a elaborate re-engineering of the car. You can actually get away with some pretty simple and easy to do accessory uh, additions that will just help protect the car 
uh, make it a little bit more customized than your own and uh, and really kind of you know give it a, a completely different look to be honest so first off uh, we've got the bumper uh, so the bonnet protector uh, at the front here now the bonnet protector is purely there for things like stone chips and stuff like that one of the things about the Jimny itself is that it's got quite a sharp um, front angle on where the bonnet meets uh, the rest of the chassis down here uh, and and it's prone to getting some some pretty gnarly chips on it so in order to kind of avoid that you've just got this um, bonnet protector there um, and it does help out a hell of a lot um, something else I've all also done is added these corner guards now the reason why I added the corner guards to it is is two things one um, is I like the look of it. <laughs> uh, so I got these off uh, once again, I think it might've been an AliExpress job or something like that. Um, and I do like the look of it. It's like that kind of, you know, faux checker plate kind of situation. Um, and there was something that I put on uh, about a year ago and it was just a, a new addition to the car to make it once again, a little bit more recognizable um, as the Mighty Overlander is my own. Um, but also what it, the main reason why I got it was because of this. You can see the way that the aerial is set up on the ARB bar, if I take the stubby cooler off it, Wild Track one, thank you Wild Track, um, is that it's connected down here just behind the actual loop, which means that it, when it bounces around, it actually bounces into the car itself. And one thing I was concerned about was whether or not I was going to be getting um, small like dents and scratches and things like that on this little corner here. And I didn't really want that. So instead of repositioning the, um, the aerial, because I think the aerial is quite good there, it's pretty well protected. Um, but what I wanted to do was then protect the corner. Um, and obviously I wasn't going to do just one, so I did all four of them. Um, and I think it does give a pretty cool aesthetic to the side of the vehicle. Um, and it just makes it, yeah, just look a little bit more like my own. Um, and then moving back, we've also got the little uh, replacement um, dynamic um, indicator lights. Now, these are super easy to install. I think I've got like a two minute video on how to install those. Um, they're just an eBay job. And it just blacks out that side and makes them kind of look a little bit you know, a little bit cooler um, and adds just down to, to the, uh, this aesthetic that I've got of the, the black and the, and the kinetic yellow vehicle. So I really do quite like that. And then also to finish it off, I've also got the side body molding straight from Suzuki Australia. Um, now with those side body moldings, I think I paid uh, whatever the retail price of them are. I think they're about 120 bucks maybe. I don't know, they, they may have changed. Um, with those, what they're designed to do is kind of stop uh, the part of the vehicle from getting um, knocked from things like doors opening onto your your car um, and also kind of, you know, the, you know, shopping center trolley dings. Pretty much any damage that I do to this vehicle, I'd prefer to do myself out here on the trail with a story behind it. You know, I don't want massive chips and dings in my door because, you know, some, you know, inconsiderate person's bashed their door into it or a trolley into it or something like that. So, yeah, that, that's the main reason behind that. And it all kind of ties in together, you know, quite quite nicely as well. All right, um, heading back, we're going to have a look at the rear side of the vehicle, um, in particular, um, the way that it's set up with the, um, the grab me gear bag and also the ladder and whatnot. And we'll have a look at that now. All right, team, so there's a fair bit going on on the back of the vehicle, but we'll start with the spare wheel um, and then we'll talk about the ladder and whatnot. So the spare wheel system that I've got set up here is the Grab Me Gear trash bag. Now, myself, um, I've gone through uh, three different uh, spare wheel bags now are the ones that I've tried. However, this is by far the best that I've come up with. Um, and, you know, I bought this off uh, Grab Me Gear um, a couple of months ago before we went on the Gun Barrel Highway, and it's just performed amazingly. Um, there's a couple of features of it that I really do quite like. So first off, it's made from heavy duty canvas, um, which means that it's going to put up with an absolute hiding, which it has. Um, you know, look, I mean, you see how dusty and everything that they get um, when you come out into the trails and everything. But in particular, this heavy duty zips, um, they are really, you know, they, they stay closed, they don't falter, um, and they're, they're really quite good. Now, one of the other things that I do like about it is when you open it up, you've got this PVC liner that you can actually 
completely remove and, and pull out. So if you need to wash it or anything like that or use it for another purpose, then you can. And the thing that I like the most about that is that um, the other bags that I've used before, I had to then have plastic bags and stuff like that with me to make sure that they were um, not stinking up the canvas itself. And if you get one, then you have to put your rubbish somewhere. So it goes in there and then inevitably it stinks up the canvas. So yeah, no, really, really happy with that. So we've also got this canvas pocket at the front and I use this for things like my shovel um, and like my tent pegs and things like that. Stuff that's normally gonna dirty anyway. And I'll just throw that in there. It frees up space on the inside of the vehicle. And it also means that I'm able to um, have easy access to it as well. Especially if it's like dark or, or you know, it's a crowded campsite. I don't want to have to keep opening up the, the, the rear of the vehicle or if it's raining or something like that, then I can just access, you know, the shovel or the axe or something like that from straight on the back. Now, also on the back of the vehicle on the spare wheel, we have the gas bottle holder from Kayon. Now, um, there's a full install video on the channel for this one. And full disclosure, Kayon did send me this along with uh, quite a few of the other items in the back of the car. Um, for me, this is a must for the compact four-wheel drive or any four-wheel drive, to be honest. Um, mainly because, one, it keeps big, bulky gas bottles out of the back of the vehicle. So you've got volatile, heavy, bulky chemicals in the back of the car that you don't really want on the inside of the cab. Um, but it also means that it gets put into a spot that's easily accessible. Now, I'm not the tallest guy in the world, so having it here opposed to up on the roof is a, a big advantage for me. Now, if you're here in Western Australia, we have a, a campfire ban or a total fire ban from December 1st through to March 31st inclusive. So whenever I come camping in the summertime, I'm limited to liquid fuel type uh, cooking, which is obviously going to be, for me, gas, you know, using either a jet ball or my Coleman Hyperflame or something like that. So I've got to put the gas somewhere and that's where it goes. Now um, I took this across the gun barrel highway, both of these items, um, and as you can see they're still with me now, uh, six months later kind of thing, um, they're absolutely loving it. So you know definitely recommend those particular ones. Um, are there other wheel bags and other gas bottle holders on the market? Yeah sure, you know there's a few others out there. Um, with the Grab Me Gear bag, look the thing that I like about it the most is that it's a WA made product. Um, and once again though, you know, I'll have to say, keep supporting your local guys. And that's the same with Kayon. You know, they're a Queensland company, Australian made, um, and they're, you know, designed specifically for these kinds of spare wheel applications. And the other items that I'll go through later on are specifically designed for the Jimny. You know, so they keep all of these kinds of things in mind. The right, um, I believe that there is a larger version of the GearMate. I think this is the 26. Uh, I believe that there is a larger version of this one. Um, so yeah, you know, check out Grab Me Gear. You know, really good quality stuff. And I've got a fair bit more of their gear on the inside. Now, also on the back, um, I've got this front runner ladder which leads up to the front runner roof rack, which we'll get into after this. A lot of people ask me, why do I bother having a ladder on the back of uh, a Jimny? You know, they're not extremely tall or anything like that. Well, guess what? Neither am I. So I use this all the time. I'm always up and down off my roof. One of the things about a Jimny is that space is a premium. So these large bulky items like your, um, you know, your sleeping systems and stuff, generally go up on the roof, my kayak goes up on the roof and things like that. So um, in order to get up there um, and actually do your, your straps and everything like that and get up there safely, um, I put the front runner uh, ladder on. Now with the, this particular ladder, it's bolted through the, um, the actual hinge on this side and I wouldn't recommend trying to get up onto the roof with your door open, you'll probably rip your, your door off. Um, and then it's anchored to the top of the door there. Look, I've been running this now for um, over three years, I believe. It was one of the, the other mods that I did kind of early on in the piece. And it's been amazing. The only thing that ever happened like with it that was wrong is one of the rubbers perished on the back. Um, I flicked a message to Frontrunner and they just sent me another one. So, you know, it's a brilliant company. Um, they've really well looked after me. And, um, you know, I pay for everything from them. You know, they're not sponsored or anything like that. But, you know, it's a, it's a good piece of kit, you know, and it's specifically designed for the Jimny. So, yeah, definitely worth, um, worth having a look at for that, especially if you're a bit more like me and you're a bit shorter and you need to get up onto that roof. Now, speaking of the roof, let's jump up and have a look up there. All 
All right, roof rack systems. Now this is a bit of a hot topic for a lot of people throughout the four-wheel drive uh, community, uh, in particular with the Jimny community, mainly because of things like um, roof, like loading limits and things like that. Um, the only advice that I'll give is you know, follow your manufacturer specifications for warranty purposes and insurance purposes. Uh, beyond that, it's, you know, any risk that you take is your own risk, so crack on from there. Now, when it comes down to the way that I've got my particular roof set up, so first off, the main part of the system is the front runner slimline two roof rack with the six tall feet. Now, the tall feet obviously clamp onto the gutter here, um, but what that does is it gives me a larger clearance between the actual roof and the roof rack itself. And that means that I'm able to fit in the front runner stainless steel table in the middle between the, the roof rack and the roof in that dead space there. That's a particularly good piece of kit. Um, I am a big fan of it personally because it means that you're able to get a decent sized table um, out to the campsite that you can eat off, prepare food on, cook with, all of those kinds of things. But it also means that um, you're using up that dead space and you're not having to put a big table on the inside of the vehicle. Now there are other options out there. I believe Kayon have just uh, released their version of a um, underslung um, roof rack mounted table system, um, which uses, I think, just trestle tables, so which is a lighter version of, uh, you know, rather than using a big stainless steel one. So definitely check those ones out. Um, but I've been really happy with the front runner one. I picked mine up second hand for, oh God, it must, might've been about 500 bucks or something. That's one of the cons on this one and the front runner gear in general, it is pretty hexy. Um, if you have the money, then yeah, look, you know, you want nice things, you gotta pay for it, I guess. Um, but when it comes down to the, the cost versus, um, you know, versus what you're kind of getting, um, just keep that in mind that they are, they are pretty, pretty expensive. Now, um, the roof rack itself is weighted, uh, rated at like a, a bazillion kind of kgs kind of things, way more than what the actual roof itself is, is manufacturer's specifications say that it can handle. So, you know, um, you're not gonna have any issues there in regards to how much the rack itself can handle. It's more about how much the rack plus whatever you put on the rack is on top of the roof. So yeah, keep that in mind there. Now, um, the other part of the roof rack is obviously gonna be the awning system. Now the awning system is um, the Rhino Rat Batwing Compact. And this has been on the vehicle since day dot. Um, along with the bull bar and the roof racks, the awning was basically the next thing to go on. And I went with the, um, the Rhino Rack Batwing mainly because one, there wasn't anything else available at the time. Um, and two, I really like it. It's a really good piece of kit and you get a heap of coverage, like heaps of under cover coverage with um, the 270 style awning. Um, as a shorter guy, I actually find it considerably easier to deploy and pack away this particular type of awning opposed to like a standard straight pull one. I don't really, um, I don't really, yeah, I don't really like those straight pull ones. They, they tend to just be a bit, you know, yeah, I find them a little bit difficult to put, uh, yeah, in and out and I also find that um, you don't get a, enough coverage unless you start adding like extra kind of side awnings and stuff on so that tends to be a little bit of a problem there. Speaking of side awnings I do have the extra side awning piece for this one um, you know and uh, like throughout this I'll be overlaying different images so I'm sure here you can see where I've, I've set it up um, and that provides a bit of privacy a bit of extra shade but more so provides a bit of a windbreak as well. Um, keep in mind with all of the 270 type awnings that um, they, they do have a downside, which there is a potential for them to have a bit of extra wind caught up underneath them. And if they go, they tend to break the hinge at the back here because um, it's usually like a, a single pivot point on the way out. There are a whole heap of different ones on the market, um, you know, from Rhino Rack, the Chaos Gear one called the Nomad Bub. The uh, ones from Darchi and 23.0, uh, Bushwhacker do one, I believe. Uh, so there's a whole heap of different ones out there. But for the money um, and what you kind of like, the quality of this product, I've been really happy for it. However, I am going to change it. Um, it's been on there now for coming up the, the four year mark. It's been on for the, the entirety of the build. And I, find, I found that it's the, I found that it's starting to show its age. Um, now, the problem with uh, with stuff on the outside of the vehicle, it's obviously going to um, cop weathering, and in particular an awning, cop weathering faster than what the 
uh, the stuff on the inside of the vehicle is going to cop, if you know what I mean. So when it comes down to the awning itself, look, it's been deployed pretty much every other weekend for the last almost four years, you know, so it's certainly got a huge workout. Um, I've really, you know, been quite thankful for it because it's, it's saved me from you know, from storms and from terrible rain and beating sun and all those kinds of things, it is a, a really good awning. The downside though, is that it's also pretty heavy. Now there are 270 awnings on the market which are lighter, and that's what I'm gonna be exploring because I generally will put my awning on and leave it on. There are people out there that put like the quick clips on and they'll, you know, put it on and off and all that kind of stuff, you know. You know, I don't, I don't have time for that. You know, I've, I'll, I'll go camping every other weekend and if I'm constantly having to, you know, attach stuff to the car, you know, as well as doing the normal packing, you know, no, nah, unsubscribe, I'm not interested in doing that. So I want to leave it on the vehicle. That means I need something that is going to be uh, able to stand the harsh Australian environment, um, but also needs to be a bit lighter as well. Um, this one, plus the roof rack and all that kind of stuff, doesn't leave me much, um, you know, space in regards to putting a, um, you know, an actual loading up there as well. So generally speaking, I mean, I've got an air mattress and a stretcher tent on there today. That's it, you know. Um, so I'll usually only have my stretcher and swag, you know, nothing else. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll put the kayak up there and, you know, that's it. You know, the kayak only weighs 20 kilos when it's unrigged. So, you know, that, I'm hoping that that doesn't put me over too much or that, that it doesn't put me over at all, um, the weight limit. But, you know, that's it, you know. And even when it comes to the kayak, I'll eventually be putting that on a trailer anyway. So, you know, that's one of the, um, you know, one of the downsides to the heavier roof system and the heavier awning is that you are kind of eating into your overall weight limit of the roof. Um, also up there, I've got my, um, you can kind of see there, um, you've got the recovery board holder. Um, this is purely, um, I like it, you know, I think it looks cool on the side of the car. Um, it's easier to kind of, you know, pull, pull them off and then deploy them as required. Um, also save space inside the vehicle. They're not that heavy, you know, it's a kilo or two there, you know, so they're not too bad. Um, and they're compatible with a whole heap of different ones. And they're a front runner system as well. Um, keep in mind if you go something like a front runner roof rack or the ARB base rack, um, the Rhino rack systems that they've got out there and so on and so forth, um, just be aware of what it does in regards to your compatibility with awnings. So because I've got a Rhino rack awning and a front runner roof rack, I had to kind of mess around and kind of custom make some brackets for the back of, uh, for the, the underside here. Um, and that means that it's, um, it's a little bit more effort than, you know, maybe some people want to put into, you know, they just want to plug and play kind of thing. So it's certainly not that. Um, there are some ones that you can get from Front Runner, some, some awning pieces, uh, like holders and stuff like that, that can do stuff for you there. So, and I believe that there's ones which like will give you the option to be able to quick release them and stuff like that. So putting them on and off isn't as bad, but yeah, there's options out there. Um, I've also put some lighting underneath my um, awning as well from Wild Track Leisure Australia. Um, you know, full disclaimer, they sponsor the channel. Um, and they are there, it's like a three LED light bar system. And then basically they stay under there, you know, so they're weatherproof and they sit under there. Whenever I deploy the actual, um, the actual awning itself, then I'm able to get full coverage lighting underneath. Um, and I like that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and the only other thing that I've got up on the top of the roof um, is I've got a couple of pads up there um, which are purely for my kayak to sit on um, when I am taking the links out for a, for a paddle. Um, and I've also got two little XTM um, five or six inch light bars either side, seven inch light bars either side. Um, now they're linked in with the intensity lights so they're not separate. Um, they just come on when I turn my spotties on and they're purely there just to offer a little bit more coverage in regards to flooding out the sides of um, the bush and the road when I'm driving through places where there's a higher risk of things like animal strikes and things like that. Um, it's yeah, it's certainly worth um, keeping in mind that kind of stuff when it comes to um, the lights that you choose. Um, also kept taking in mind things like depending on the state that you're in, um, they, they have different laws and all that kind of stuff uh, regarding all of that kind of stuff as well. So you might only be able to have, you know, like a light bar or like things have to be in even bloody pairs or some something like that. Here in WA, they're, they're a little bit more sensible as long as they're, 
you know, properly mounted and they're safe, then you're pretty much good. I'm sure that there are more rules out there and leave a comment below, please inform me. Um, but yeah, you've got uh, other stuff there as well. Um, all right, so the pros and cons of this particular roof rack system, um, sturdy as, um, heaps of accessories, and uh, it looks the goods. Um, you know, you're never gonna exceed the, the load limit of the roof rack you know, you're gonna far exceed the load limit of the roof before you even get close to that. The downside is it is a touch heavy, um, including things like the, um, you know, the awning and everything like that, and the table and the lights and the, you know, so you start hanging a bit of extra stuff off the car um, and it's just, you know, it does get a bit heavy. Um, eventually, I think I might actually change to like a, like a mini camp trailer um, and that may alleviate some of those issues there. But I've been very happy with it. Um, at the time, it was the only one available. So back when I got the car in 2019, um, it was the only one available. There wasn't a Rhino Rack system, the ARB system hadn't come out. Will I change from this? Uh, if I go to a different vehicle, then um, I will go to a vehicle that can handle a, hot, a heavier load on the roof. And that means that I'll just go back to front runner. Um, if I keep the Jimny and I decide to, I, I don't know if I would. Um, Maybe, maybe. Look, if I was to change, like, all right, hypothetically, if I was to change from the front runner roof rack system, what would I go? I'd probably go the ARB base rate, okay? It's the lightest of them, um, and it and it's still pretty sturdy, and it means that you can, you can stack the roof a little bit better in that respect, but for the most part, yeah, um, I'm pretty happy with the front runner one, and I don't necessarily think I'll change, if that makes sense. <laughs> all right, cool. Let's jump into the back of the vehicle. Now, I am out camping at the moment, so I've um, left the car as uh, in its packed form, um, and then once I've finished the walk around, I'll actually go through and do a full, uh, you know, what it looks like when it's unpacked, so you can have a look at that too. All right, so I've packed the vehicle, um, and you can see now how I've got it set up in the back with all of my gear in there. All right, so let's jump in there and have a look. All right, so probably one of the most important parts of the build and how things have changed over the time has been what's been going on in the back, okay? The cargo system on any Jimny is gonna be your biggest challenge. Uh, space is a premium, you know, and I keep saying that because it is, um, but also weight restrictions, um, also uh, trying to keep a clear field of view out the back of the vehicle, things like that. It all, all of these factors kind of come in together um, in regards to how you want to set it up. Um, also the very fact of convenience and utility. You know, you need to be able to, you know, actually want to set it up in a certain way for those uh, those camping purposes and overlanding purposes if you're going for a setup in the back, anything similar to this. So like I said before, Kayon did send me all of their gear. Now one of the best pieces of kit in the back of the vehicle um, that I have put in has been this Kayon roof shelf. It provides a excellent use of space. That dead space above here, like in this kind of bubble part of the roof that never gets used, um, just sits there and is once, like I said, dead space. It doesn't get used and you end up with a whole heap of clutter down here. Now they're rated to about 10 kilos or so, so you can fit a fair bit up there. I mean, 10 kilos in the grand scheme of things for a lot of those smaller cluttery items um, is a fair bit. I use it to keep my solar panel set from Wild Trek Leisure Australia. Um, I use it for my tackle gear. Um, I use it to throw my um, fishing rods up here. So I've got my, my fishing rod tube that I throw up the top here. And this is the ones from, I think, Assassin and Razor's Edge. Pretty cool rods. Um, and also I throw it throw up things like my extra awning, uh, sidewall, and things like that. The, the main idea is that you're keeping all of those cluttery items away from the middle. And that's particularly important for uh, these kinds of builds and anything to do with off-roading as well. You don't want just loose items in the back. You want everything kind of modular and stored away nice and tight. Um, the only thing that I will say about this particular um, this particular product here is for myself, um, what I usually like to do is actually just run a bungee strap across the back if I know that I'm gonna be doing some particularly heavy off-roading. And the main reason for that is, is if I do stack it right up, um, I don't wanna have any risk of things like popping out and banging into things and breaking stuff. Um, I wanna try and keep it up there as much as possible. So I just put like one of those thick, um, like one of these thick 
um, straps across the front of it and that just keeps everything there in place. On the two windows at the back there, I've got the Molly panels from Kaon. And once again, they are fantastic for those little Molly pouches to throw random items in um, and keep them away from the center of the vehicle. Now, the best part about that is, especially on this side where I've got the, um, the survival first aid equipment stuff from survival. Um, once again, thanks to survival for sending that, <laughs> sending that stuff out. Um, that's where I've got all that lined up on the other side of the fridge there. It doesn't get used all the time, but it's still easy to access. Um, and because of the, those molly type um, those multi type pouches, they're able to kind of stay up there out of the way um, and yeah, really handy spot. On the other side, I've got a couple more molly pouches. Usually I have that for things like batteries for my GoPros. I've got one which has got a quick access for salt and pepper shakers and some knives and forks and stuff like that, camping knives and forks. Um, and that allows me to uh, kind of once again, you know, reduce the clutter down a little bit. Now, one of the newest items to the vehicle, um, and you would have only just seen the install guide for this one here, is the K-On drop down table um, for the rear door. Now this is an absolutely brilliant piece of kit because uh, those of you that are fans of the Jimny, you'll be well aware that the back door opens up on a bit of an angle. And that means that um, if you were to try and just replace that door card, the plastic door card that's in there with um, something that's flat and straight, then you're going to end up with a table that's you know, basically on the piss. So um, K-On to come up with this awesome little uh, deal here where you bring it down and it's just your two hinges there. And then this back corner comes up and you've got a nice flat table here. Absolutely brilliant piece of kit. It was an absolute breeze to install. Myself and Phil the mechanic did this the other day um, and it is brilliant. So I uh, hope you enjoy that, that install video. It's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty comprehensive one. Um, look, in general, these are gonna be really handy for me, especially while I'm fishing or if I'm just stopping on the side of the road, you know, I just need somewhere to put my, you know, my lunch or, or make something up. Um, very, very handy to have this extra little table space without having to get down the big K on, uh, the big front runner table on the back. Um, one of the cons of this one though, is that if you use the, the uh, original fit um, uh, little cargo box thing that sits down in this section, um, it's like they, they bang into each other so you kind of can't use that one if you install this. That being said though, um, I never use it anyway and I don't think any of the guys that do a full kit out in the back actually use it either. So yeah, really, really good piece of kit. Um, doesn't rattle at all. I was out um, driving with it on the way in to this particular campsite, some pretty heavy duty off-roading and nothing. You know, no rattles, no nothing, um, and it's great. Just remember though, always to unclick it before you put it back up or it's gonna bind up when you do it. Um, and it's just held in with a couple of bungees. So yeah, pretty cool piece of kit that one. I'm very happy with it. And um, and the install video was, was great fun to, to put together. Um, yeah, no, I really liked it. All right, so now moving on to the power system that I've chosen for the back of the vehicle here as well. Now, um, I've gone with the Nomad PDU, which is a 100 amp hour lithium power station and it's pretty much an all-in-one kind of unit and it's a pretty compact unit in the grand scheme of things. Um, it gives you a whole heap of functionality in regards to inputs and outputs. So you've got two charging options, either a regulated supply like I've got from my um, Wildtrack solar panel set because it's got its own MPPT controller on it. Therefore it's regulated and it can be charged through um, through that side of things at 25 amp hour. Um, or if you've got say an unregulated power supply like just a standalone um, uh, solar panel that doesn't have its own regulator or anything like that, you can still bang it into this system through the other option which has its own internal MPPT controller but that's limited to only 10 amp an hour. Um, I also have it um, connected all the time to the five amp hour um, charging um, little DC DC charger um, that plugs into the back of the Jimny there. I am gonna upgrade that one to a 10 amp DC DC charger eventually, um, purely just because the, the five amp's good, but I do need a bit of extra. Um, one charge, if I've got the fridge already down to temperature and it's running on eco, will get me about four days. Um, so quick overnighters and stuff like that. I don't even bother bringing out my, um, my solar panel set. 
Um, and as long as I've got this all set up correctly, then that's fine. Um, it also, I use it to charge my drone batteries, my camera gear, um, and I also plug in the lighting system from the awning straight into that one as well. And it runs everything um, absolutely brilliantly. Uh, later on, I'm thinking about getting one of those little travel ovens to put right here, um, little hang down one. And um, so yeah, I'll run that one as well. Hence why I'll get the bigger DC, DC charger because that will suck the juice a little bit. Um, but yeah, brilliant piece of kit, Nomad PDU, West Australian brand as well. Um, and I paid for that one when I picked it up um, last year sometime, I can't remember exactly when, but a uh, really, really good piece of kit. So um, check those ones out, um, they're not bad. Now there are other options available um, from a whole host of different brands, including Wildtrack, they've got the Voltec series, which is awesome. Um, I think you've also got like iTech World, have got a couple of other ones and you know, and you've got a, you've got a whole heap. The main thing is that you find something that's gonna be applicable to your use. So if you're gonna be running 240 volt equipment or anything like that, I don't personally, but if you're gonna be running any 240 volt equipment, have a look at the Voltec series. It's got its own internal inverter and it's a pure sine wave inverter. So it's really good for things like laptops and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's got a few other different options. Whereas the Nomad, um, it's a bit more rustic for my uses and uh, it serves me really well. So yeah, have a look at those. They're, they're really quite good. Um, now speaking of Wildtrack, we've got the Wildtrack Cool Light 50 fridge in the back. Now I did have an Oz Trail uh, 45 litre fridge and that sat over this side. Um, but instead I put, and I did have a drawer over this side if you remember, um, but I, I ripped all that out and I replaced it. Now the main reason why, so the 45 litre fridge that was here, first off was you know kind of short and fat, you know, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, and when I got the roof shelf put in and everything like that, it would kind of just like get to there and I wasn't able to access the, the fridge very well. Um, and because of it, it was quite a large footprint on the back, so I lost a lot of gear uh, space in the back. And so that was a little bit annoying. So instead what I did was I put a single light fridge slide on this side um, that you can see here, and I've got the, the Cool Light 50. Now, um, this one, yes, Wildtrack gave it to me, they're the main sponsor of the channel. Um, main reason why I like this particular fridge though is that it's quite narrow. Um, that means that um, its footprint is quite compact, perfect for the back of the chimney. It's actually 50 litres over 45, so I've got an extra five litres of capacity there um, and it actually takes up by rights less room because with the other one there was all that dead space above it that I couldn't use anyway. So um, better to put one on a fridge slide and um, use the space a little bit better. Now, um, one of the other things I do really like about it is that it's a single sealed, um, you know, plastic insert on the inside of it. Makes cleaning really easy. Um, there's no like, uh, like seams or crevices or anything like that that your, you know, bugs and bacteria and stuff can breed in. Um, and because it's all plastic, you can just wipe it out and drain it and it's good to go. It's got a little drain plug in the bottom. Um, and it's even got a little USB charger on it. Um, I haven't actually used that one yet, but um, you know, if you're in a pinch and you're all the other USB points are kind of taken, you can jump on that one. Now, personally, the way that I do this one is I've got the um, LED display facing towards me in the car, opposed to facing um, backwards. Now, this is for two reasons. One, that's the way that the fridge slot is. If I had to put it over this side, then you know I'd probably have it in the back. But more so that if I'm driving along and there's an issue with the fridge, not that I've had one yet, um, I can see on that LED display through my rearview mirror, um, and I can see that there's no, and I can see if there's an issue straight away. If my temperature's gone up or for some reason it's turned off, I can see it straight away. Um, you know, otherwise you kind of have to wait until you stop at destination. That could be hours down the track, and you could spoil food and drinks and stuff like that. So you know, keep that in mind for that one. Um, pros and cons over this side of things. So um, look, there's no real cons for the. The, the cool light, um, it's a lightweight, rugged, I mean, look, this has been to the Gunbarrel Highway and back. Um, it's pretty much exactly what I've been after. The only thing that could make it better if it's had an ice compartment, um, you know, which, you know, you want something like that, you're gonna have to get something considerably bigger and more expensive. Um, the, the bad part about this system, however, is nothing to do with the fridge, and has everything to do with this bloody fridge slide. So, um, myself and a good mate of mine built 
the um, the brackets that I've got in the back for the fridge slide together. Um, he just basically welded them up for me and they have worked an absolute treat during the time that I've used them. However, with the extra weight of the fridge and stuff there, they're not going to be, because that was originally for the, the drawer system, they're not gonna be you know, a long-term solution. Um, I took the, look, they're working fine. I took them across the gun barrel for highway and stuff like that, but it's just not as stable as I want it to be. So what's the option there? Well, um, there's two options. Um, I either just continue on with it and put up with it, or I change the, uh, the fridge slide out and the bracket system out for something more like what, say, Bush Tech have to offer, um, which is the, because I, I still want to keep my rear seats, um, which is basically a, a bracketing system that uses the anchor points of the seats themselves. Um, and if I do that, what I will do is I'll actually do a dual fridge slide system and put the extra gas strut on the door, pushing it all the way out. Now, um, I've seen a few issues with that though, hence why I'm a little bit hesitant to do so. So, um, in order to do the dual fridge slide system, you do need to get a longer gas strut. Be very, very careful about replacing the gas strut on your car. Um, if you get the wrong one that's too powerful, um, it will push the door out too fast and it will break straight out of the bottom of the, the, the actual door molding itself and it will snap straight out, it will tear the metal. So keep that in mind. Um, the, the best thing to really do in that situation is to uh, probably order one specifically for the Jimny. I think there are ones on places like Oz Jimny and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I'll end up doing. But it will be very, you know, very specific to what I do. If you do put one on and you find that it is a little bit too quick and you don't want to change it back, um, the best option is to make yourself a check strap. And what I mean by check strap is basically something that can go on here and on the car itself, uh, basically a, a, a strap. So once it gets out to its maximum, um, it will arrest the actual door and stop it from uh, over traveling and potentially, and, and going too fast and potentially ripping out the, um, the actual gas strut molding in the bottom of the door. Um, all right, what else have I got going on the back here? Okay, so as you can see, um, I'm using the little um, anchor points and whatnot in the bottom of the, um, the windows there to put a few straps and stuff in. That's also the way that those molly panels go in. Um, so I'll put a few straps there. So my um, chair and my little stool and everything like that is on this side, um, as you can see there. Um, and then obviously on the other side, I keep that for um, the bracket, which holds the Nomad PDU in. But in the center here, um, this is where I've got these things. These are from Grab Me Gear, um, and they're the clear top gear mates, the little clear top canvas pods. And I use two of these. I've got a larger one, um, which is all of my cooking gear, and I've got the small one, which I put all my dry foods in. Um, so having a decent sized fridge means that I've been able to put most of my you know, food and stuff into the fridge itself, but I've still got to put somewhere for my dry food, but then I've also got to put somewhere for all of my cooking gear. So putting them into these, uh, these canvas pods, I've got something rattling around in there at the moment. Um, putting them in these canvas pods, they are super durable. Um, they're clear top, so you can go, oh yep, that's what I want, and pull it out, and you can remove the whole thing, and they're, they're quite uh, modular as well. Hence why I do want to put um, the, um, the second slide in, and actually have it almost as like, a, like an open top drawer. Um, and basically, obviously this would have to go out, but I'd be able to pull this out and go, yep, that's what I want, and then kind of crack on with it from there. Um, I believe Adrian from the Rome Overlander was one of the first to do that. Um, and I think he actually worked with Bush Tech directly, coming up with the idea for those brackets. So, um, you know, um, and he pretty much had the ultimate micro Overlander set up um, and really, really interesting way of kind of looking at it. Um, I personally don't run the drawer anymore because the drawer itself was a bit too heavy. Um, and you also drawers are usually quite tall and quite big, which means that you're, you're starting to eat into uh, some of that usable space. So personally, I think a, like a, a slide with the clear top totes on top is definitely the way to go for that one. Um, now, one of the biggest challenges that you will have in regards to space and everything like that is water storage. Um, now, this isn't a mod or anything like that. Um, this is just where I keep my water. Um, this is the 
um, little um, water bladders. I've got two of these um, that I usually put here and here for smaller trips like I'm doing at the moment. I just put the one. They're two 10 litre water bladders. Um, you can go as far as putting big jerry cans and all that kind of stuff. Problem with jerry cans is that once they're empty, they're still full, like they're still like a big bulky item. Um, at least with these little um, bladders, you can actually just roll them up once you're done. So they're handy. Um, and my recovery gear is from Sabre Off Road. So thank you very much to Sabre. They sent me this one out last year. Um, we tried to do a recovery vi uh, video um, with Bobby from Lens Nation, but we couldn't get the bloody chimneys uh, bogged. So we've had to readdress that at a, at a later stage. And I'm gonna do that uh, probably pretty soon, actually. Um, really, really good gear. Um, it's all of the, the lighter weight kind of soft shackles and lighter weight kinetic rope and all those kinds of things and all the gear I need for my winching and stuff all in here. Um, and once again, it's a clear top bag, so I know what's in there. Um, and also, um, it came with the uh, recovery point for my rear tow hitch that I'll cover off in a moment as well. Um, all right, so pros and cons overall in the back here. So yes, the chimney is limited on space, okay? Um, my gas cooker sits just behind the, re the passenger seat. My sleeping bag and pillows sit just behind the driver's seat. Um, usually I'll throw my camp oven and stuff like that for when I'm doing that kind of camping under, uh, just underneath my uh, sleeping system there and I just kind of stack it up like that. Yes, it is somewhat limited, all right? But you just have to be a bit more deliberate with what you take. You can't just take absolutely everything. Um, you know, if something doesn't have two uses, then it's useless, you know, people sometimes say. But the main thing is, yeah, that you, you just pick your, your battles when it comes down to packing the, the rear of the chimney. Um, make sure that you use that, you know, that normal normally dead space at the top here. Um, you know, use slides and stuff where possible. Use water bladders where possible. Yeah, so that's probably a better way that I found. Um, I've gone through like two or three different iterations of the actual, um, uh, of the rear cargo setup. Um, you know, I've had the, the drawer in there. I've just had it like a bucket, like a tub thing. Um, you know, I've had the, the, the other battery system that sat in behind the passenger seat. Look, nothing's really worked until I kind of went to this. Now, obviously the only thing I really want to change at the moment is the fridge slide, just because I want a bit more strength in it. But apart from that, everything is pretty much spot on. I took this all the way to Uluru and back, you know, two weeks, four and a half thousand Ks. And, you know, other than every now and then it got a little bit messy in the back and I needed to kind of reset things. That was more because of the type of work that I was doing, jumping, jumping out of the car, constantly setting up and packing up camp. Not so much that it was a cluttering system. Um, that was me, you know, just being flat out the whole time. So yeah, you've got that uh, in the back. All right, so that's the back done. Let's go into the final part, which is the front in the driver's area where we'll talk about the UHF um, and we'll also talk about some of the little storage options that I've done in the front. All right, so before we actually zip up to the front, um, one piece of advice, go get yourself some of these little covers here. So these little covers, uh, they're just for the little de uh, demister um, wiring that goes through your rear window to for the, the rear window heater. Um, they don't come with any kind of covers for protection there. And there's just the risk that you're gonna hook something on it and rip them out, then, you, then your, uh, your rear window heating's gonna be cactus and you'll have a foggy window. Um, my mate Mitch Hardcastle, uh, he gave me these ones, thanks Mitch. Um, yeah, no, really good little uh, thing. And they're just like a stick on thing. So yeah, pretty easy to put on. All right, let's jump in the front. All right, so in the front. Now, uh, there's a few items in here which are more kind of like conveniences and stuff like that, opposed to being like full on mods. Um, obviously the first big mod is the GME radio, uh, the UHF. Now, with that um, in particular, it is very important that you have yourself a decent two-way radio system. Um, mainly for being able to talk to other vehicles whilst on the trails, but also being able to call out for help as well um, across a whole heap of different channels if you find yourself in strife. So that one's always handy. I've got that one, um, a full install video for that one on the channel as well that I did with Phil the Mechanic. Um, now, some of the the storage options and stuff that I've got, I've still got my phone holder over here. This is just one of those little suction cap ones. Um, it keeps it kind of just 
you know, off to the to the right hand side there. I can still see it if something comes up on it, um, but it's not distracting or anything like that. And also it doesn't bounce all over the place whenever I'm doing off-road stuff, which is the main thing. Um, I've got one of the little uh, Grab Me Gear uh, dash organizers here. Um, these are absolutely fantastic. Um, I use it to like, you know, keep my wallet and uh, work ID and stuff like that. Um, keep that in, so really handy there. Um, and I quite like the fact that it just Velcros down to my dash mat. Um, and that, and it's almost like it's a perfect little, it's perfect size for the Jimny. Um, and we've got this little flat spot just in front of the dash there, and that's really handy as well. Um, over the other side here, um, I've got just a 511 Molly pack that I hang off the little Jesus bar there. Um, and that's just got my water bottle hanging off of it, my, um, my little torch um, hanging off of it, um, a little glow stick, um, my uh, def tire deflators are in there, uh, my bug spray, my little mesh thing for my for my head if the flies are getting too intense, um, and also my little handheld two-way radio and a knife. Um, so it's just like gear that I need to kind of grab just on the go. You know, need a knife, boom, there it is. Um, you know, I need my handheld two-way because I'm walking away from the vehicle. I've got it uh, there, nice and accessible there as well. Um, and that's, you know, definitely um, a, a pretty handy kind of piece of kit there. Um, the other one that I've got in here is also the little center console. Um, it does use the little spots where your your factory cup holders are but those factory cup holders are bloody useless anyway um, they're kind of like you know you got to crane your arm and scratch your back before you actually get to them so instead yeah just um, much more comfortable to drive something to lean on um, and because there's like the the door skins are quite thin um, you know you've got like nowhere really to put your arm so yeah to, to be able to lean on that one um, is a little bit more comfortable especially for those longer drives um, also in here we've got the throttle grenade throttle controller um, and I'll talk about that one a little bit more in regards to uh, the final part which will be some of the full drive stuff that I've done including the suspension, the snorkel and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah look the, the way that I've got this set up oh, and also I've got little dash a uh, little visor molly pack up here as well. The way that I've got it set up in the front here, the main idea is that things are relatively easy to get. Um, usually when I'm on a, like a long trip, I'll hang a camel back off the back of the seat here um, and everything like that so I can just have water on the go. Um, and it just means that things are just easy to grab. You know, I don't have to take my eyes off the road or anything. I know where everything is. Um, you know, the, the UHF's just within hand range there and all that kind of stuff. Um, and everything else. Everything else that I've put in here, however, is purely aesthetic. So I've got like a million and one of these uh, um, uh, morale patches now. So the Velcro patches from all the different brands and content creators that I follow and, and all that kind of stuff. So they're all up there. Uh, we've got my little uh, dancing Hawaiian uh, girl, the little hula girl on the front there from uh, uh, when we went to Hawaii. I made my pick that one up for me. Thank you very much, Maddie. Um, and then obviously you've got the dash mat there as well. And the dash mat's good. It just helps reduce the amount of heat that's pumping onto the dash, which means it's gonna help with your air con a little bit um, and also reduce any glare bouncing off of that as well. So yeah, apart from that, the only other thing is the seat covers. So I've got a set of the Desol uh, seat covers, the canvas seat covers from the fellas over in South Africa there. And I got my mate over, Nathan over at uh, Screen Printing Australia to custom embroider the, uh, the channel logo on the headrests. Um, really easy to install, very hard wearing. I've taken these, you know, everywhere with me now um, and they are still looking the goods. Um, protect the actual seats themselves so they don't get trashed um, and everything like that. And I also hang my um, my headlamp on the uh, on the passenger side there, which is, a, I don't know, it's an overlander thing, I guess. Um, and we just, yeah, put those up there. Uh, but look, apart from that, that's pretty much everything inside here. So let's jump outside and have a look at the last few mods of the car, which is more about the full driving and recovery side of things. Um, going back, cool, let's have a look. <laughs> Okay, so the last few things to talk about with the vehicle are the uh, is the snorkel setup, the tire and suspension uh, setup, and also the tow bar on the back. Um, so when it comes to the snorkel, there's quite a few different snorkels that were on the market. Um, I hadn't done one at that stage, so the 
snorkel I chose was the TJM one. Um, I just like the look of it. They're, look, at the end of the day, most snorkels all do the same kind of job anyway. Um, but I just like the look of it. It's a little bit more boxy and stuff like that. So I, I quite liked that. I th thought it looked quite cool. Um, I was offered a torque at one, um, but in the end, I kind of steered away from the, the stainless steel bazooka type one. It wasn't really for me. Um, so yeah, I went and bought this one instead. Um, it's been really good. It does give off a bit of a note when you're, when you're under load. It kind of gives a bit of a burr kind of sound. <laughs> um, so how does it go, Tony? Burr. Um, so yeah, I quite like that one. Um, and it also keeps my air intake high enough. So if I do any small water crossings, like the ones that we were doing down in Warren recently, or um, when you're driving on the tracks and it's quite dusty, you can throw the old sock over the front of it and uh, you know keep that uh, dust out. Now, the other uh, things that we'll talk about down here are the tires, wheels, and suspension. So uh, tires, wheels, and suspension. Right, tires, BF Goodrich, KO2, 235 by 75 by 15s on CSA steel wheels at 15 by seven inch uh, at a negative six offset. Um, and I'm running the 50 mil uh, Ironman lift GVM upgrade with the um, heavier springs and all that kind of stuff as well to account for the load. Um, we've got the long ranger fuel tank in the back, which replaces the um, the standard fuel tank of 40 litres all the way out to 80. So that's a absolute must if you're going to be doing any longer trips. And then we've got the um, Heyman Reese tow bar on the back, which I've got the Sabre um, soft shackle recovery point slotted into that one. So with the tyres, um, I chose the BF Goodriches because I actually had um, the 215 by 75s on the vehicle um, before I got the lift done, um, and that was in the early days. They've been a fantastic tyre. However, I believe that they're very difficult to get your hands on now. So I'll probably be changing over to something else. So if you've got a recommendation for a different, um, the different kind of a tyre setup, let me know. I will be sticking with these wheels though. Um, the main reason why I went with steel wheels opposed to like the Dirty Life ones or a, like a myriad of other different you know, you know, four driving rims that are out there is that they're always gonna make these steel wheels. They've been making them forever and they probably will. If I ding one, then my, um, the ability for me to get another one at a decent price is quite good. If I was to say lose one of the, the more unique kind of wheel sets, and it was a few years after I bought them, there's a high probability that they're gonna be very difficult to get my hands on, um, and I'll end up having to replace the whole lot. So the steel wheels, yeah, look, they're a bit heavier, um, but I like the look of them. I went with the black ones, um, and I think they're quite cool. Um, and the negative six offset pushes me just to the edge of my guards, but not beyond, and just gives me a slightly wider stance on the vehicle. Um, and obviously the wheels being a fair bit wider as well just makes the car handle um, considerably better and just feels a bit more planted. Um, the long range fuel tank. So that was a bit of a, a mission. Oh, that was a last minute dot com kind of thing before I uh, went on the gun barrel highway. If you're gonna do any long uh, overlanding trips, including things like the gun barrel or, or anything else, um, the 40 litre tank's just not gonna cut it. And having to fill up via jerry can every 10 minutes is not gonna be the way to go. Um, means that you're also carrying more, you know, potential volatile chemicals on your roof and all those kinds of things, and it's just a bloody nightmare. Um, if I do carry any extra uh, fuel on the roof, however, I've got these two five litre jerry cans, and here's a hot tip. Two five litre jerry cans have a considerably lower profile, so they're gonna be uh, considerably less wind resistant and cause any issues up on the roof, but also manhandling a five litre, um, which you can actually get six litres in by the way, um, to fill the car up um, is so much easier than trying to do a 10 or a 20, you know, um, and the easier getting on and off the roof, especially if you're a short ass like me, um, easy to get up there, strap them down and you're good to go. Um, so yeah, the, the long range of fuel tanks are definitely um, my pick of the two options for extended range fuel. The um, other one I believe is a Browns Davis one, which is I believe a reworking of your exhaust and all that kind of stuff in order to fit an auxiliary tank in behind the axles opposed to over the top of them in front of them. Um, not a fan of that one. It's an auxiliary tank that pumps into your standard. Um, if it's all you can get though, it's, you know, I was that close to getting it because it was all I was gonna be able to get my hands on. Um, personally, the, the Long Ranger, that's, that's the ticket. Um, really, really good product. If you can get your hands on one, they're, they're a little bit hard to get your hands on for a little while there. 
All right, um, and to finish off on the rear of the vehicle is the Heyman Reese tow bar. Um, I don't use it as much as I thought I would at the moment, but I will once I get the camp trailer. Um, well, not camp trailer, but kayak trailer with a little campy aspect to it. Um, you don't have to have a tow ball and a chimney, to be honest. Uh, like the tow system there is purely there because I got it when I picked up the boat um, back at the start of 2022. But the truth is, or the end of 2021, um, the truth is, is that uh, it's a really good point for um, for recovery, though. Um, so that's that's definitely something that's a, a bonus with it. Um, with that particular Heyman Reese one, that cost me about 900 bucks or a thousand bucks, fully installed and stuff like that. Got it here in Perth. Um, there's a few other ones that are out there. Um, keep in mind if you've got any aftermarket bars, like the uh, I know that my mate Bobby's got the. I think it's called Wild Dog or something like that. Um, they come with their own tow hitch and they're not necessarily compatible with the different hitch shapes and stuff. Um, just keep that in mind if you do change out your rear bar that, and you've already got something like this, just to keep that one uh, on in mind. I believe that the Bay House rear bar might be coming out this year and I've been talking to the guys there um, and I believe that they are trying to make it so it's compatible with like aftermarket uh, tow bars and things like that. Um, and obviously the Sabre off-road little recovery hitch in that one. Extremely handy, once again, rated for those soft shackles. But yeah, uh, look, anything else to add in on the vehicle? Well, um, future, future stuff, future stuff. All right, I've still got to put the diff breathers in and I've still got to do the rock sliders um, and I've got to work out that rear cargo system. Undecided on whether or not I'll put a rear bar on. Um, We'll discuss that when that, that comes. It's, it's a distinct possibility, but we'll talk about that later. Um, but they're the three future things that I'm probably gonna be doing. Um, you've got the, the cargo system. Look, I just need to tighten up the last little bit and it'll be, and it'll be perfect. Um, the rock sliders, just for some protection ones. I'll likely go the Bay House ones for that. Um, they are just what I need. I don't need anything with like steps and stuff because I've got the ladder on the back. Um, and then the diff breathers are a must. Uh, there's a high probability I'll go the diesel ones actually from South Africa. Um, I'll always say, look, when it comes down to picking my stuff, I always try and go Australian first. But uh, you know what? The pretty close second is the stuff from, from South Africa. Their climate, their terrain, their engineering is very similar to the Australian Outback and the gear that they make is very much suited for that. So if you go for something that's a little bit more down that line, then it will certainly, uh, certainly do the goods for you. All right, well, there you go, team. That's the, the Jimny now. Um, it's been a long time coming, this build. Um, it's basically, look, I mean, I've done almost 85,000 Ks. The vehicle's almost four years old. It's four years old in about a month. Um, and it's, it's really a, um, a labor of love in regards to that. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone that has jumped on board in regards to um, helping with sponsorships and gear for the, the vehicle itself, um, including, you know, uh, Bay House, Custom Off-Road, uh, K-On Australia in particular. Uh, they've done an absolute bang up job remodeling the inside of the car. That uh, the, the roof shelf and the Molly frame system, the rear table, the gas bottle uh, holder, they're just phenomenal pieces of kit and they will really do your Jimny wonders. Um, and also I'd like to thank Sabre for the recovery kit for that one there as well. Um, thanks very much for your support at Grab Me Gear whilst I've bought all the gear that I use from them. The support that they give me in regards to uh, interactions online and also looking after me when I need something in a hurry. Um, Jimmy over at Grab Me Gear looks after myself and all of his customers extremely well in regards to that. Um, then we've also got the guys over at Wild Track Leisure Australia um, with all the camping gear and everything like that that I use, in particular the fridge and everything. Um, and that's uh, a lot of a lot of the the sponsorship for the channel comes from Wild Track. So thank you very much to those guys. Um, and also um, the Nomad PDU guys, you've really supported me with your. Um, with your servicing and your help with warranty stuff. I did have a charger that went uh, went duff and um, Wayne over at Nomad just gave me a new one. Um, covered under warranty, there you go mate, on, on your bike, get back into it. So yeah, um, once again, another awesome West Australian uh, product there and uh, yeah, go support your guys. Uh, apart from that, um, you know, it's been a great, 
great rig. Um, I don't see myself getting a different car. Um, you know, if, if I was to get something different, I'd probably go the complete other direction and get something massive. But I don't think I'd do that, uh, to be honest. I, I love driving the Jimny. It's one of my my real joys of of the the outdoor lifestyle is um, the the access that the Jimny affords me to to get out there, have a bit of fun, get down some of the tracks that some of the big rigs can't get down, um, and also have a, a unique platform for my content. Um, and like I said. Uh, you know, I've said before, you know, in a sea of 79 series and ranges, uh, the Jimny really does stand out, um, even in its diminutive size. But yeah, really uh, a really fun car. All right, team, there you go. Well, thank you very much for watching. Um, this has been a full walk around of the Jimny, and uh, hopefully uh, this helps you with some of your own ideas. Um, there's going to be more happening to the Jimny over time, but for now, uh, I think that the rig's at a pretty good spot. There you have it. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, please, if you liked this video, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, and you'll be up to date with all of my content as it comes live. Um, but also, uh, leave a comment below. Tell me what your favorite part about your Jimny, your build, your, your vehicle, uh, my vehicle, you know, uh, that you like. Uh, any questions, please hit me up on um, the comments or flip me a message on Instagram. I'm more than happy to help you out, guys. Um, thank you very much for supporting me, and I'll definitely do my best to support you. All right, enjoy, and I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.